Good evening, everyone. Hello, my name is Rodney Hakim, and I welcome you to the latest episode of New York Shakespeare Live right here on Instagram Live. Thank you all for joining us here tonight. We are having our first live episode of the month of June. It is Monday night, June 6th. We are into the summer season, and we are approaching peak Shakespeare. Uh, we are at the point now where we're just about anywhere you turn in New York, you're going to run into a group doing outdoor Shakespeare. It is the outdoor Shakespeare season and Shakespeare in the Park, perhaps the biggest name in the world of Shakespeare in New York, is just around the corner. I believe, if I have it correctly, they were originally slated to begin their performances. Uh, Richard III starring uh, Danai Gurira from the, uh, the uh, Black Panther series film series uh, that is slated to begin on, it was on uh, June 17th, I believe it's been pushed back to June 21st, but that again is one of the biggest things happening in New York, but we are very blessed this year in the New York Shakespeare scene, uh, we have an enormity of huge, huge things happening in the world of Shakespeare, perhaps more so than in any year in recent memory. Uh, this year we not only have such a huge Shakespeare in the park with uh, the major film star Denai Gurira in the role of Richard III, we also also had to start the year, we had the film version of Macbeth starring uh, Denzel Washington. We also currently have on Broadway, a big, big ticket, we have Daniel Craig and Ruth Nega as Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, a stage version and a film version of Macbeth. The Broadway version is going strong. It's getting a, a, lot, of, a lot of strong reviews. And uh, Daniel Craig, the former James Bond as Macbeth, just received the Broadway.com award for Best Leading Actor uh, for his portrayal of Macbeth. So that's very, very big. We also, this year, we had a lot of other exciting things happening in the Shakespeare scene. We had John Douglas Thompson as Shylock in a production of The Merchant of Venice. And we have all of the wonderful guests joining us here tonight who have fantastic productions. We'll be speaking to so many of them. And we have, if you're if you're a New Yorker, you know that if you go into a good uh, deli, you're going to get a nice big overstuffed sandwich. Well, tonight we have an overstuffed sandwich full of Shakespeare for you. Uh, if you're new to the world of New York Shakespeare, what we are all about is that we try to bring you as much Shakespeare as we possibly can that is happening here in New York. Now, whether that is stage performances, whether that is film screenings, book releases, podcasts, whatever the case might be, we try to bring as much of that Shakespeare content that's happening in New York and in the surrounding areas to you across social media, whether it's here on Instagram, whether it's on our Facebook page, our Facebook group, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on WordPress, on YouTube, and in so many other places, we try to bring you New York Shakespeare for free, as much content as we can. You can go back and catch all of our past interviews, all our past discussions, our panel discussions, our classes, so much programming. It's all available for free. It's right here on Instagram, and it's also available in our YouTube uh, presentation and you can find again all that content it's all there it's all free and one of the things we'll be referencing tonight is the uh, the previous discussion we had both about outdoor Shakespeare in New York we had two of those discussions last year and also last year we had a discussion about producing Shakespeare on Broadway off Broadway and beyond and we'll be speaking with uh, some of our guests tonight about that about what it's like in the current environment of coming out of COVID and all the, the lockdowns and all the restrictions and everything that was happening in that environment and getting back onto the stage, back into the face-to-face -face person format. So uh, we have so many exciting guests for you tonight. First off, we're going to have uh, we're going to have uh, uh, Mark Saltzman, the writer of the hit off Broadway show Romeo and Bernadette, and they are a New York Times critics pick, and that's a wonderful show, uh, a humorous musical take on the Romeo and Juliet story. Uh, brought into the modern times in Brooklyn, I believe. And we'll speak to Mark about that. We were supposed to have his colleague, Justin uh, Ross Cohen, join us tonight. Unfortunately, I believe Justin had some technical issues. He won't be able to join the program, but we are very, very happy to have uh, Mark Saltzman join us here tonight. Next up after that, we are going to have Christopher Carter Sanderson, our 2001, uh, 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award winner uh, of the pioneering group uh, Guerrilla Rep. He is going to be here with his uh, lead actor, uh, Henry Austin Chicago, uh, from their film version of Hamlet. 
Next up after that, we will have uh, the costume designer extraordinaire, Sabrina Fabi, from uh, the New York classical production of Cymbeline, which will be playing in parks around the city uh, this month and after. Uh, we will also have uh, from our friends over at uh, Hamlet Isn't Dead, uh, who, who very humorously tout themselves as the 847th best Shakespeare company in New York, but that number keeps incrementally going up. We'll have a trio of representatives from that group joining us here tonight. Uh, beyond that, we'll have Jonathan Hopkins of the Brooklyn Brace, uh, uh, Brooklyn, say that three times fast, Brooklyn-based group Smith Street Stage. He'll be joining us here tonight to tell us about their production of the Comedy of Errors that's coming to the Carroll Park section of Brooklyn this summer. And last but not least, we will have uh, Nicole Savin and Danny Higgins of the Long Island-based troupe The East Line Theater. And they're going to tell us about their touring production of The Two Gentlemen of Verona and all the places that that's going to be playing. So we have a jam, jam, jam-packed program for you tonight. Now, typically our New York, uh, New York Shakespeare Institute live programs run about an hour but with the all all the amazing interviews that we have coming up for you tonight i think we'll be going past that so i would say uh grab a nice beverage bass grab a, a, a martini grab a beer grab a whatever you like i'm going to be uh giving a shameless plug and grabbing a cup that is from one of our favorite podcasts the bardcast it's shakespeare you dick <laughs> they are our 2021 award winners in the podcast category and i'll be sipping along with my beverage and guess what might be in it through the course of the program so a sip to you from our friends at the bardcast okay so uh before we begin i just want to remind all of our guests who'll be uh, speaking with us live tonight that if you are going to be joining us live in the interviews uh throughout the proceedings of this evening. And remember, you need to be on your uh, tablet or on a mobile device, a smartphone, an iPhone, an Android uh, phone of some kind. If you're on a desktop or a laptop, it will not provide you the interview functionality. You can watch and comment in the comment section at the bottom of the page from a desktop or a laptop. But if you want to communicate with us live in the broadcast, you have to make sure you're on a smartphone or a tablet. Okay, so without any further ado, let me close out this picture and let us bring on our very first guest of the evening, and that is going to be the writer of the hit off-Broadway show, Romeo and Bernadette, and this is playing uh, at, I believe it's Theater 555 uh, on the West Side, and this is a show that is a New York Times critic pick. It's gotten great reviews all over town, and this is Mark Saltzman. So I'm gonna invite Mark to join us. Uh, let's see, where is Mark? Oh, Mark is unable to join. Uh, so Mark, I'm gonna send another request. Okay, so Mark, uh, for whatever reason it might be, uh, I'm trying to send you a request to go live, but it is not allowing me to do so. If for some reason you're on a desktop or a laptop, uh, I'll give you a moment to switch over to a smartphone or a tablet, and I'll vamp, as we say in the in the theater game, for a while while you uh, have a chance to uh, switch over to uh, whatever other format you might want to use this. So uh, before we proceed with the interview, uh, we have the, the social media team of Romeo and Bernadette here, and uh, I'm going to ask them, you can but drop it down in the chat section at the bottom of the page. Uh, the Romeo and Bernadette team, while we're waiting for Mark to, to be able to connect, uh, what are the dates that uh, Romeo and Bernadette is running? I believe it runs through the end of this month, but uh, we are going to just make sure uh, what that looks like. Uh, Mark says he's on his tablet. Okay, so I'm going to try it again a different way, Mark. And oh, let's see if I can do it this way. So Mark, I sent you an invitation, and if that pops up on your screen, you could just click on that, uh, and it should bring you on live. Uh, again, you know the, the Instagram live format, as wonderful it is, it is uh, unfortunately not uncommon that our guests do have some technical issues, uh, as it is a, a new and evolving technology. Uh, but uh, let's see if we can get Mark to join us. Nonetheless, uh, Romeo and Bernadette. For those of you who uh, are not familiar, it's it's. Uh, it's kind of like, if, if I was going to describe it, I would say it's kind of like something between uh, Romeo and Juliet meets West Side Story meets Kiss Me Kate with a little bit of uh, modern uh, vernacular and uh, a Brooklyn feel thrown in. So, uh, Mark, I don't know if you're able to connect with us. Let's see if we can find 
uh, the dates from the social media team from uh, Romeo and Bernadette. Uh, what? Oh, Mark is unable to join. Okay, so uh, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Uh, Mark, I'm going to try one more time to connect with you. Uh, if not, then we will uh, reshuffle and go to our next guest and then come back to you a little bit later in the program. So let me try one more time to connect to Mark from this other direction here. Oh, that is Romeo and Bernadette. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, let's try it this way. Mark Saltzman. Mark is unable to join. Okay, so unfortunately, Mark, uh, I'm trying to... Uh, connect with you, but it's just not allowing me to do so. Uh, if you want, maybe uh, take a moment to, uh, I'm not seeing the invite. Should be, a, yeah, Mark, I'm sorry. I'm trying to send you an invite from a couple of different ways in the format here, and unfortunately it's not. Every time I try to do that, it's telling me that you are unable to join. So uh, we're going to close out this image. We will go to uh, our next guests in the program, and Mark will come back to you after that. So hang in there. Perhaps if you want to confer on the side with your social media team, just make sure that you guys are uh, your tablet is uh, is able to connect. Uh, again, it's it's for our guests, and not just for Mark, but for our guests this evening. Uh, the way we're going to connect is that I'll send you an invite on your screen. You just tap it with your finger that says uh, "Go Live with New York Shakespeare," and once you do that, you should be uh, all set to join me. Uh, online, as long as your your tablet or your smartphone has a uh, front-facing camera and uh, you're up to whatever the, the latest version of Instagram is, you're on the Instagram app, you're not on uh, the, you know, the, uh, the browser, the internet browser, you should be good to go. So, uh, Mark, we will come back to you and Romeo and Bernadette in a little bit. Let us jump forward to our friends Christopher Carter Sanderson and uh, Henry Austin Chicago, and that is from the film version of Hamlet. So uh, before we bring them on, uh, Christopher, I, uh, for those who don't know Christopher Carter Sanderson, he is the, the, uh, the, the chief of the long-running and pioneering troop Guerrilla Rep. And they have been playing downtown and all around town in New York City for over 25 years. They have revolutionized the playing style here in the city. And whereas outdoor Shakespeare was once only uh, the, the uh, province of Shakespeare in the Park at Central Park, uh, CRISPR was one of the ones who really brought that to the people. He, he made it uh, uh, something that happened every summer downtown in Washington Square Park, in Fort Tryon Park, uptown, and, and all around town. And they are renowned for their annual productions of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, also for their versions of Macbeth. Uh, he followed that up during the pandemic era with his film version of Macbeth, which was just fantastic. And one of our uh, top choices uh, of that year uh, now, Christopher is following that up with a film version of Hamlet, starring the the fantastic actor Henry Austin Chicago. I will ask Christopher and Henry to join us. Uh, let me see if I can send those invites out. Okay, let's send that one to you, Christopher. Christopher, how are you, my friend? I'm well, Rodney. How are you? Uh, you you oh, make me feel so young. 25 years is, uh, I'm afraid, a little bit shy of the mark. It was uh, <laughs> 33 years ago the Gorilla Rap started all this stuff. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? You are, you are timeless, uh, Christopher. <laughs> you, you know what, Christopher? Uh, in the days that I was coming to see you guys do your shows uh, down in, uh, in uh, uh, Washington Square Park, and here's uh, Henry will ask you to join us as well, uh, what, one of the things that, that you guys did with your shows back in the day. Hello, Henry. Oh. Oh, hey. my IG is looking. Okay, well, you're here. So, so you just sent me a note that your, your uh, IG might be freezing. So if we lose you, I'll send you another request, and we'll, we'll just try to keep working. It seems, you know, it seems like one of those nights. I think maybe I said Macbeth too many times uh, throughout the, uh, the opening of tonight's broadcast. So I think maybe the, the, the theater gods are, are about to smite my version of uh, IG Live. And you know, another one of our guests, uh, Jonathan Hopkins of Smith Street Stage, uh, he was on an episode, our only episode to date, that was a lost episode because usually after the episode airs, uh, the whole thing will be saved onto the uh, video section of Instagram Live. And his, for some reason or other, mm. his previous episode just disappeared into the ether. So hopefully the Instagram gods <laughs> uh, 
whoever they might be, Mike, Mark Zuckerberg, or wherever he might be in, in uh, California, is going to smile down on us and allow us to proceed at pace. All right. So, gentlemen, uh, Christopher, what I was saying was that back in the days when I would come down to Washington Square Park every year to see uh, Miss, it, it, for me, it was like an annual pilgrimage to come down to uh, Washington Square Park and see you guys do a Midsummer Night's Dream. And something that was, was so wonderful about those productions was that uh, you guys uh, would move yourselves and the audience from place to place uh, around the park, and we'd run with you. And in all the years that I saw the different casts and I saw you know, all the different variations of, uh, of that show, I think you were running faster than any of the actors ever did. So uh, <laughs> you, you are angels, my friend. You are, are, uh, are always, uh, always in, in great shape. So, so tell me, uh, Christopher, what, what's happening with you? Tell us about Hamlet. Sure. Uh, well, we, we, we uh, meet at a very aus auspicious and uh, uh, extraordinary time. Um, one of the things about, uh, you know, the great goal of, of this way of filmmaking that, that I, I worked on with Macbeth and, and now with Hamlet is we've really been trying to transport the the cast into the room that the audience is in. That's been our desire. So it's just like totally be wherever you are, be wherever you are when you're watching. And um, and so we chose the aspect ratio of TikTok, um, you know, early on when we decided to do that with with Macbeth. And and so just a few days ago, Instagram itself, the the honored and vaunted Instagram, uh, has switched their go to uh, image editing aspect ratio to that TikTok aspect ratio. And of course, TikTok just keeps exploding and exploding and more and more people are seeing it. And so, you know, I, you know, one of the greatest things I love to hear about a gorilla rep show of any kind is that somebody watched it and they, and they come to me and say, oh my God, this is the first time I ever walked, watched, uh, you know, uh, a Shakespeare and I had no idea it was like this and I love it and it was so much fun and it was wonderful and I'm gonna go read it and I wanna see it. And, and that's what Hank's, uh, performance is doing for people in, in Hamlet. It's letting them just feel like that whole cast comes right into their room. And um, the tools that we used, uh, that we learned from Macbeth to, to do that even more clearly, um, Hank just took and just, you know, absolutely ran with. So we're right on the cusp of starting to hear about some uh, film festival uh, participation. Um, I can tell your audience a bit of a scoop. Uh, keep an eye out for screenings of Hamlet in New York City. And keep your eyes open, especially next month. And that's all I can say right now. But um, you may be seeing us okay. uh, uh, in a theater near you or maybe projected for free on a wall near you, maybe in Washington Square Park, maybe. <laughs> ah, of all places, coming back to the the, uh, the birthplace where uh, Gorilla Rep was all born. Began. All right, right. so, so uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes, uh, our eyes peeled and our ears to the ground as to what's happening. So, Henry... Uh, you are uh, at the heart of this film. You are uh, you are Hamlet. Uh, you are the melancholy Dane, but you're. Uh, I don't think I could describe you as a melancholy person. I mean, you're you're so vivid and so uh, active uh, in this thing. It's 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 like a tour de force of watching all the emotions that that you're experiencing through this thing. And something that that's so unique about uh, these films that Christopher makes. And I mentioned mm -hmm. this in, in the review of Macbeth that I put out uh, when, when that film came out. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry, Instagram gods. Um, that in the height of the coronavirus era, when everyone was only on uh, Zoom and you know, mm -hmm. everything was, you, know, you looked at your, your screen all day and all you saw was you know, faces and squares. Uh, something about the way that Christopher shoots these things or asks his actors to shoot themselves with their iPhones for his films is that it's not just, you know, like, like collarbone or chest up. It's like extreme close-ups of your face and sometimes mm -hmm. like almost unsettlingly so uh, with, with how close up it gets. Uh, so with you, I, something that was really interesting to me about how this particular film functioned is that yes, it's still that same extreme close up where you're all, each actor is shooting on an iPhone uh, and then sending the, the, the segments to Chris where he's putting them all together into a film format. Right. But to, to get the, the effect of a close up as, as opposed to what would be in a traditional film is just like a super cut of like from maybe like your, your upper lip up to your, the top of your eyes. Right. So, uh, so what kind of instructions were you given, Henry, as to how to film yourself 
to uh, allow CRISPR to achieve that that crazy effect. Hmm. Jeez, Louise. Um, <laughs> I would have to say, well, first of all, what I'll share right away is that it it was strangely very fitting shooting solo with no one around you with just the camera during COVID. And right. for myself personally, uh, the sort of isolation you felt on weeks on end with just you and the camera and this beautiful language somehow helped inform something. There was something which just clicked about the sort of uh, loneliness that this character was feeling or, you know, with the court, with his family. It's a beautiful family drama, beautiful family drama, but feeling so alienated. Uh, so there was something which was helping me there, which I kind of hooked into. And um, the one great piece of advice which I got from Christopher was make the camera your best friend. That was, that was something which really helped, especially with the longevity of the shooting solo with no one around you. Um, uh, because then you could really just work with your imagination. So it was really about just being with yourself and your imagination and then throwing something at the wall and seeing what stick and then sending it over to the, you know, director and, and the lovely production team and, and just trusting them with their process. So, so Christopher, I'll throw that to you now. Uh, I know that, that for you, the process of taking all of that, all that data, all of the, that video content, that each of your, I think it's what, 12 actors, 13 actors? 14. Something like that, right, Christopher? It's at least 14. Okay. Yeah, some, something like that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 12 to 15 actors. Uh, no, no, no. You're, not, Rodney, you're so, you're so indoctrinated, wonderfully indoctrinated in theater uh, that you're thinking of the Shakespeare cast as 12 to 14 people for a Shakespeare, um, for, for a Shakespeare production. But the truth is that there's actually over 20 characters in Hamlet. And in, in film, you really can't double, especially not in close-up, because people are going to know it's somebody different. Now, what we did do with the players is we had one, I had one master player, which, you know, this is my fifth time uh, directing Hamlet, and just, you know, just fantastic uh, to take it into new places and learn more about it from, from uh, Henry's wonderful performance and all the performances of the amazing actors. Um, but in the case, we, we only managed to do one cast reduction from the, like, 25 or whatever, was uh, we had Mark Greenfield, um, play the master player and all the characters in the play within the play are, are uh, little puppets that I made. And, and now let me jump in for one. And thing by the way, say this, uh, one thing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Bef before you go into what you're saying, I just have to say a, a, a shout out to Mark Greenfield. If he's out there, that, that part in the middle where he's the, the player King and he has all the puppets and he's a one man band, so to speak, doing all that stuff is just, it's just, it almost steals the whole thing. It's wonderful. Well, that's my basic direction to any actor is go on stage and steal the show. And then all the actors in the whole cast know that all these incredibly talented people are putting their absolute maximum into the work, working to steal the show. And then we do something really interesting, which is we manage to serve the audience because there's no second, there's no word, there's no jot or tittle of any Shakespearean script that is throwaway, that can be thrown away. And, and every single one of them can be, get, can be used to give the audience these extraordinary gems uh, which 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 Hank did and and um but the thing I was trying to jump in and say you you charming bastard is that I didn't edit it you know I, I did work I did work with the editor but again you're trying to make me out as this god of of Shakespeare and I love Shakespeare and I taught Shakespeare at Yale and Princeton and all over the place and all that I I just love it and I hope that love comes through in in, in my you, work um you literally wrote the book <laughs> on on outdoor Shakespeare. This is, this is Christopher's it's a book, new way of doing at the College of Yale. And Princeton and all over the damn place. You know, the funny thing is, I literally got a copy of the dissertation from a, a, a student at Lancaster University last week. And the dissertation um, was interviewing me about the origin of, of, of uh, what, what they're calling immersive theater. You know, in the 60s, it started being called environmental theater. We never reinvent the wheel in the theater. We, we find a few interesting things new to, to maybe do to it, you know. Um, but my point is that Lisa Barron was an extraordinary editor and she had an editing team. So I gave them their, their uh, marching orders and, and they absolutely did it wonderfully. 
And and the amazing thing about 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 it too is that once we finished it, I didn't do all the music. That was that was Phil Cadet and his fantastic um, you know work and and you know all that coming together to make something bigger than all of our contributions is certainly what I always aspire to with any piece in, in theater or film. And but you know it was funny because you know Hank uh, Hank agreed. Uh, Hank, I hope I'm not calling you out, man. But but Hank agreed to do the role. Um, and he said he asked me when we start shooting, and he said I'll agree to it with one additional clause, which is that you and me meet, what was it, once a week for, for a few months before we started. We, we, went to, we went to school, right? We went to school yeah. and just worked and worked it. And, and, um, and Phil just spent, you know, Jesus, almost a year doing the music. And, and Lisa was doing it all the year. And all, the, all three of these um, wonderful, amazing people and every single actor, all the way down to every, you know, it was only in the last week or so before we finished the film that, like, Phil said to me something along the lines of, you do know that this is Hamlet, right? That it's over three hours of, of, of film. It actually is a long film. You, you know, and the t- subtext is, you know, you nutcase. <laughs> so, you know, it was a huge marathon, right. but every step of it had to be fa- fascinating and interesting and important for the audience. And Hank honored that and just busted his everything. I just, this, the piece is a piece for, for the ages. It's, it's a great, Hank's work is a great gift to me because I want, my great, great, great grandchildren, if they say, oh, yeah, your great, great granddad had something to do with theater or film. I wanted to watch this film and I want them to know that this is what I loved about the world. And this is what I wanted to give the world and put in the world for people. Well, I have to say, uh, last time, a couple of years ago, when you put out the film version of Macbeth, uh, you discovered a friend uh, whose name is on the tip of my tongue, but for some reason it's not coming out. What's, what's our, our friend's our name? Our star? There? Lugeda? Lugeda? Lugeda Robinson. Yeah. Uh, Lugeda Robinson. He, he was fantastic as Macbeth in that film. And he, uh, he's only uh, in, uh, as, as uh, um, um, uh, the, the, the from, from uh, Norway uh, coming in. Uh, some, for some reason, it's, it's uh, eluding me tonight. But uh, he's only uh, briefly in this Oh, film, he comes but... back. You're right. We have him back to play, to play Fort right. Ross. Fort and, Bross, um, Bross, that right. is, Fort yes, yes. And that's a spoiler. The, okay, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, uh, so uh, he was like the discovery of Macbeth. And uh, for me, uh, Henry is the discovery here. So you have two fantastic, fantastic actors that you've discovered and plugged into these, these uh, title roles. And uh, in both cases, I'd say you know, the film itself is, it should be seen just because it's a, a great film, but uh, see these films to see these two wonderful actors just killing it in the title roles. Uh, so, uh, Chris, for uh, Henry, we have a huge show uh, tonight. Uh, I, unfortunately, I can't keep you on for the whole hour, although I'd love to ch- chat with you. And uh, we will actually be doing that in a couple of weeks. We'll have our Zoom conversation with uh, yourselves and the rest of the cast and crew of uh, oh, Hamlet and uh, Keep Your Eyes peeled here to the New York Shakespeare social media as to when that's going to be and how that's going to appear. But congratulations, guys. Uh, where, if the audience wants to come uh, check out Hamlet, uh, where, where and when can they find it? Hamlet is, is now on video on demand. And all you have to do is, is go to uh, Vimeo um, or, or do a simple uh, Google search of, um, you know, Hamlet, Gorilla Rap, Henry Chicago, Christopher Sanderson, uh, Vimeo, and it'll take you straight to it. We're a little bit low key on the release. This is what you might call a soft release. We haven't, we don't have it up on our website and stuff yet because it's a funny time and we're, we're applying to a lot of film festivals and we really want Toronto Film Festival to show us and we really want Sundance to get their heads out of their asses and get back to being an independent and show us. And we really want, uh, you know, every film festival to just know that this piece has heart, it's worth it earns its time well and many, many times over. Um, but we really can't, we can't quite push the VOD as much as we want to because that's an issue with the festival. So the, what you can do is you can search it. You will find it. What you'll find is you'll find a story on broadway.com or a mention here or there that says, go to this link uh, for it. And, um, and we'll certainly be happy to send you uh, that link for, for your website if you like. And we'll, we'll, we'll share that uh, in the, the post show, so to speak, once we put up the, the uh, notes after uh, the production uh, goes on the replay. We'll add those notes as to where people can find you guys. So I'll Chris, pop for off Henry, I'll, thank I'll you. Send you the, I'll, I'll pop off right now and send you that email, that link right away. Ronnie, I can't thank you enough. Okay. You, you know, 
being on being thank on your you show and talking with you. you is always always bodes well for my work and and uh, thank you for that good <laughs> good 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 luck and and fuck Macbeth you're you're fantastic. <laughs> thank you, thank you both, thank you both, gentlemen. It's, it's thank you, Ron. You, and we'll, we'll speak to you guys again soon. You bet. It's a pleasure. Take care. Okay. So that was Henry Austin Chicago and Christopher Carter Sanderson from Gorilla Rep. They have their new film version of Hamlet, which was just released. Uh, it's on demand. It's on Vimeo. Uh, if you go to the website for Gorilla Rep, you can find out more information. Uh, but uh, the easiest way to find information for them is to go to uh, New York Shakespeare social media and you can find the links right there. Uh, so now we will go back, hopefully, to our first guest of the evening, and that was slated to be Romeo and Bernadette. We had a little bit of uh, connectivity issues with our friend Mark Saltzman, who is the writer extraordinaire of this, this fantastic musical theater production. Let's see if we can have better luck this time around to connect with Mark Saltzman. I'll throw up the image one more time of Romeo and Bernadette. And uh, again, before, we also mentioned that uh, our other uh, colleague who was supposed to join us, that was Justin Ross Cohen. Unfortunately, he also had some connectivity issues, but uh, let's hope we can connect uh, successfully this time with Mark Saltzman and have a, a conversation and find out more about Romeo and Bernadette. So uh, I'll send the invite out one more time to Mark Saltzman. Uh, let's see if we can connect this time around. Uh, if we can't connect with uh, Mark for whatever reason, and I truly hope we can, uh, then uh, the social media team uh, should be in the chat. And I'll try to send some questions out to, to them uh, via their uh, via the chat. Guys, uh, whoever's in the chat, by all means, uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have uh, emojis, whatever you want to send us, whatever reactions you're having, by all means, send it our way. We love to hear from you. And we'll be hearing more from you in our uh, cheeky section that we call uh, I'll Show You Mine If You Show Me Yours. So hang on for that. Uh, and no discussion of that uh, while we're waiting to see if Mark can join us. No discussion of I'll show you mine if you show me yours would be complete without me forewarning you, but I will be showing you my, my willy uh, at some point during the evening's production. So uh, <laughs> the evening's discussion. So we are hoping that we are able to connect successfully with uh, Mark Saltzman, uh, and he is the writer of this uh, fantastic – oh, Mark uh, is unable to join. Okay, so uh, let me try it uh, one more time in a different way. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see if I could try it this way to connect with Mark. Unfortunately, it's just one of those nights where we're having uh, difficulties uh, making the connection. Uh, oh, and now Mark is gone, it looks like. Oh, uh, let's try it a different way. Yeah, I think I think Mark might be having some connection issues. I don't even see him, unfortunately, in the options of people that I can select from. Uh, Mark is okay. So Mark, uh, it seems like we are having some issues connecting, and unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're able to to grab you at this time. Again, we have a super size overstuffed program here, and we'll be here for quite a bit. We have a lot of interviews to go through. So if at any point, Mark, you've signed back on to uh, Instagram, if you come back, uh, and, and this applies to you, this applies to you also to the social media team for Romeo and Bernadette. Uh, if uh, Mark is able to get back on, or even if one of the social media team members, if we can't connect with Mike, wants to just come on for a minute and uh, have a chat, by all means, uh, from your screen, from the top of the screen, you have a little arrow that faces down, or even at the bottom, you have a, a little emoticon that shows a person's face with an arrow next to it. If you click that and send me a request to join, then I can bring you guys on. But it looks like we're able, unable to connect with Mark at this time. So let us move forward to our next guests of the evening. And let me throw up the image for our friends at New York Classical. And this is going to be Sabrina Fabi. And she is the, uh, okay, so it's Mystery Stage. Uh, I, I've already uh, thrown up the image for New York Classical. Hang on to that, uh, uh, Jonathan. I'll come back to you in a bit. You're going to be next up, uh, assuming that we can uh, follow in that sequence. Uh, so we'll call up Sabrina Fabi, and that is from the, uh, the veteran troupe New York Classical. Let me see if I can find Sabrina. Here we go, Sabrina Fabi. And she is the costume designer for New York Classical, they have their production of Cymbeline. Sabrina. 
Hi there. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. All right. So, Sabrina, you are uh, the costumer for uh, the current production of Cymbeline that uh, New York Classical is just about ready to present. Now, uh, I don't have the dates in front of me. So do you know when? I believe the run starts, what, this uh, Thursday the 8th or this Wednesday the 8th, right? So previews do. However, the official hard opening is not until June 21st. Um, okay. Then they do, I think, about like two weeks in Central Park. Then they move on to uh, Brookfield Commons. Um, and then they ended uh, downtown at Charles Short. So um, three different parks around the city. Okay. And, and kind of like what we were speaking about before with Christopher, with uh, Gorilla Rep and uh, their ethos of, of moving around the park and having the actors uh, move and the, the audience follow the actors, New York Classical also has a very similar uh, ideology similar but different, where they have uh, what, uh, what Stephen Bergman, the, 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 the artistic director of uh, New York Classical, likes to call his panoramic theater, where uh, you uh, run around uh, the, the park and you are, the audience is uh, only chasing you. And he, I think he calls his actors actor athletes because they have to be in such good shape from running around the park and speaking their lines and, and uh, getting their voice across such a huge open space. Uh, so, Sabrina, in, in that context, in that environment, uh, you are the costumer extraordinaire for, for this production. Uh, do you have to uh, approach making costumes for this production, not necessarily as a typical stage production, but as something where it has to be flexible enough to accommodate the movement? Absolutely. I mean, they are doing full on stage combat, but it's in the park. So there's multi layers there as far as like hills and things like that. And then they're moving around with the audience as well. Um, this is full panoramic theater. So it's very exciting. And um, it really takes you along with the story. Um, but at, from a costume point of view, things really have to be extremely durable. And then because the cast is a cast of seven obviously Shakespeare's work like there's not just seven characters so there's a lot of quick changes but the audience gets to see the quick changes so it has to look like it's choreographed um so everything is intentional everything looks like um it's for the audience because it is um and so all of these costumes it's like they're moving with intention when they're shifting through characters they're moving with intention because you see everything there's no going backstage to do a quick change, like it's all seen. Um, so it really adds like a different layer, but I feel like it adds this like raw realness as well. Okay, so Sabrina, you, you have, uh, uh, you've been doing uh, costuming for a while, but, but I, I was reading your bio and it seems like you're also uh, teaching. Uh, you, you teach, I believe it was at Marymount College? So uh, I did for a little bit. Now I, I uh, teach at Manhattanville College. Um, so I teach, uh, I teach like three classes a semester, but I teach their costume design classes. Um, it's really fun for academia. I think it's like a different level of your brain versus like when you're in a show. I think that's a very different part of your brain as well. Um, but I think it's really fun. And I always like in my classes choose a Shakespeare show for my students to design. I think it's really important. So what brought you to Shakespeare? Of all, of all, you know, being a customer, I'm sure there are so many different shows they could do. What, what about Shakespeare grabbed you? I think it's just one of those things as a costume designer, especially where like you can do it in so many different eras and themes and it just, it doesn't matter. It still works. And not a lot of shows can do that and are that versatile. I think it's just like, the writing is there and the writing is there for you to play with it. And it's not like stuck in a certain time and it can't break away from that. It's just so versatile and flexible. And so I think it's just really amazing. And I gravitate towards it as a costume designer because it's like, there's so much creativity that can go into the work um, because it just is so versatile. Um, you know, for this production of Cymbeline, we're going for this like fantasy Dark Ages look. I haven't, you know, seen that a lot before, but I think it's something that is really interesting and I think it works for the show. Um, but I just think Shakespeare in general, it's like one of those things where you can move it and change it and the script is still supported no matter what. Okay, so you know, given the, the rough and tumble nature of, the, of, of 
Steven's uh, playing style, the panoramic theater style, where the actors, again, are they're running up and down and they're going from the hill and they're stage combat and everything. Uh, it, is, what's the laundering process like for, for these costumes? I'm sure the actors are, are sweating heavily running around like that. Um, is, it, is it challenging to take these things and maintain them so they don't uh, disintegrate by the end of their run? Yeah, so it's very, I would say these costumes, it's very different from like your typical, like two week run in a theater. Um, these costumes are built extremely strong. Uh, they are not built to just look pretty on film. You know, that's amazing when you can do that. But when you're in panoramic theater, and there's like audiences, and you know, there's so many things that can go wrong. I obviously it's like things can split when they're in combat. They have to be made extremely strong and extremely well. And then the other thing is the heat that happens. So yeah, obviously it's like actors are sweating. Um, and what happens when somebody is sweating? It deteriorates the costume. So it's like making these costumes to survive for essentially a little bit over like a two month run um, in these like extreme conditions. Like they will perform, um, I think up to like 95 degrees, it gets really hot and they're, they're still out there performing. Uh, and lots of layers. So it's definitely a process. You definitely get those like, you know, just sopping wet costumes at the end of the night. And that's just, you know, it's one. The nature of it. Yeah, it's the nature of the game. So uh, are you like, like, on call? Like, yeah, like the, the bat signal? Do they have, do they have like the Sabrina <laughs> signal? They're like, Sabrina, an arm just fell off our costume. We just lost a, a <laughs> or whatever. Uh, how, do, how do you go about making repairs to these things? Yeah, so for tech and previews, I'm definitely, like, I watch them like a hawk. I would say I cannot enjoy production until it's open because I'm just constantly following the costumes and making sure no one's, like, splitting their pants or something because uh, it's always somebody splits their breeches, you know. that's it's, it's <laughs> um, And it, at this point, it's just making bets of, like, who will. But um, I think for me, it's, like, uh, yeah, if something happens, I'm there. And then during the actual run, it like gets kind of handed off to the wardrobe soup. And it's always like, unless it's something really bad, I won't get a call. And then I know if I do get a call, then it was really bad. <laughs> um, mm. so that's like if somebody's, you know, dress completely splits or something. Uh, yeah. Yeah, wardrobe like, malfunction, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our previous guest, Christopher, is saying uh, costumes are the backbone of the theater. And he's absolutely right. You can have, you know, wonderful actors. You can have wonderful uh, things going on, uh, great sound, great whatever. And if the costumes are just totally out of whack and don't fit what the, is trying to be conveyed, then, then it just kind of puts a damper on everything. So, so one, one more question for you, Sabrina. Uh, given how uh, you're moving from space to space and how space itself is at a premium in New York, where do you store these costumes throughout these, this two-month run where you're going from space to space to space? Yeah, so we have a we have a storage in Manhattan, and then there's storages like near the parks. Um, a big thing is, which is very different for me, where most theaters you show up and all the costumes are on a rack and they're set up perfectly, and you don't really touch them. Um, for this, it's everything <coughs> gets transported to the park, so you just see like giant carts with garment bags, and that's pretty much how the costumes get transported. Um, but yeah, they, they get stored just in a, uh, a storage unit in Manhattan close to the park. Um, it gets packed with all these cool props and costumes. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool to see them transported <laughs> to the park and kind of um, the actors, like their, their half hour, I think, looks so different from a normal actor half hour that you would see in an actual theater. Okay. All right. Well, well I can't wait to check it out. Uh, New York Classical always does exciting stuff. And I can't wait to see what your costumes look like. Uh, Sabrina, if people want to check out the show, uh, where can they go to, to find out more details? Yep. So you can go to newyorkclassicaltheater.org. Everything is there. Um, all the contact info is there. And you can either place a reservation for any of the show dates. It's completely free. And you can place a reservation online. Or uh, you can call as well. Both work. And I think you can email if you wanted to. Um, but it's free. And come check it out. It's in Central Park. Even if you're just, you know, strolling by, see if you can grab a reservation. Yeah, and, and, and something that Stephen had impressed upon me in one of our previous conversations is that during the coronavirus era, they do require a reservation. So I, I, I urge you guys to go over to nyclassical.org and uh, make that reservation. And Sabrina, if people want to find out more about you, where can they find out more about uh, your wonderful designs? 
So I am at uh, at Sabrina Fabi Design on Instagram, and then my website is sabrinafabidesign.com. Um, I'm pretty up to date with everything I post, but you can see all my work and all my new work to come. So, yep, that's I me. Mean. All right. Well, Sabrina, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, and I can't wait to check out everything that's going on with your class well this summer. Thank you. It was amazing talking to you as well. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good night. You too. All right. So that was Sabrina Fabi. Uh, the costume designer extraordinaire of New York Classical's upcoming production of Cymbeline. will be playing in parks around New York City uh, as of this month and then uh, for several weeks throughout the course of the summer. All right, uh, next up, let us try again. We're going to keep on trying to come back. We're, we're going to keep plugging away and trying to come back to our friends at Romeo and Bernadette. Uh, they were said to be our first guest of the evening, and unfortunately, we're having some connectivity issues. Let's try and see you know, if we can throw up their image and uh, reach out to them to connect one more time. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, let's see if we can try it one more time to find our friend. Nope, 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 nope. Unfortunately, Mark Waltzman isn't present in our, in our live feed. So uh, again, uh, Romeo and Bernadette team, uh, my apologies. I, we do want to have a conversation with Mark. Uh, if, if you can reach out to him somehow, uh, behind the scenes and, and see if there's some way he can come back on perhaps on a smartphone so that we can connect with uh, with you guys and have that conversation that would be fantastic uh meanwhile let's close that out and let us move on to uh now before we bring on our next guest before we bring on uh that'll be uh our friends over at uh smith street stage before we bring that on uh, i i wanted to, to take a moment to play uh everyone's favorite game and <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, as I mentioned before, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. And I already kind of introduced the the concept where I told you I'm going to show you my willy, uh, and that that's this guy over here. Uh, but basically, what I'll show you mine if you show me yours. It's it's me showing you what I'm geeking out about about Shakespeare at this point in time, whether that's books, whether that's accessories, tchotchkes, whatever it might be. And uh, I showed you this one before when we were speaking with our friends Christopher and Henry from Gorilla Rep. This is Christopher's book. It's called Guerrilla Theater. And it's his uh, breakdown of how guerrilla theater works. And, and he literally wrote the book on what outdoor immersive theater is all about. Uh, so he has been doing it for over 30 years in New York, and he's, he's fantastic. I urge you to check this out. It's available online. Check it out on Amazon Guerrilla Theater from Christopher Carter Sanderson. Another book that I really urge you guys to check out, and one of my favorites uh, from one of our favorite writers and educators is Teaching Hamlet as My Father Died. This is from our friend Erica Cantley, and it's a, a wonderful uh, uh, autobiographical discussion about her journey into uh, discovering more and more deeply about Hamlet, uh, which she was teaching to a high school class as her father was in his final days. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, teaching him as my father died from Erica Cantley. One of our guests last month uh, was uh, was I'm sorry Michael Blanding, and his book is In Shakespeare's Shadow. And Michael is not even really a, a big Shakespeare person, but he's an investigative journalist, and in his journalism, he came across a question about the Shakespeare authorship issue. And for many people, that is, you know, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to know about the Shakespeare authorship issue, but he's not approaching it in the, the way you always hear about Edward de Vere, it's Queen Elizabeth, you know, whatever the case is. He takes a totally different tack on it. Uh, and, and I urge you guys to check out his book, In Shakespeare's Shadow by Michael Blanding. Great, great book, really great read. Uh, as he described it last month, it's almost like a beach read. It's a very, very conversational style. I urge you to check that out. Another book, and this one is from uh, one of the most noted historians in the world as it relates to ancient Rome, and beyond that, uh, in many other topics, is Mary Beard, and this is her latest release. This is Twelve Caesars, and in this book, she discusses uh, Julius Caesar, she discusses uh, the Roman plays, but uh, it's, it's not really a Shakespeare book, but it's Shakespeare adjacent, I would say. It's uh, just a fantastic book, and we were able to contribute to this in some small way. So uh, look for that. Look for our, uh, that little shout-out in there. Uh, so this is 12 Caesars from Mary Beard. And getting away from books and into something different, uh, here is something that uh, <laughs> my kids enjoy. And this is uh, it's, it's, it's kind of falling apart, but no, it's, it's a magnetic poetry 
uh, based on Shakespeare's language. So uh, what you have is you have all these little uh, magnet magnetic words that are Shakespeare's texts. And for, for my kids, it's become a game to make sentences out of these. Uh, so I'm, I'm training them early. So you can find that. I'm sure you can find that online somewhere. Okay, so that is, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Now, I've shown you mine. I urge the audience out there, whoever wants to, whoever is brave enough to show me theirs. So at any point, you can drop a note in the text box uh, in the bottom of the, uh, in the page in the comment section. You can uh, send us a notification. And if any of our guests who are coming up, uh, our remaining guests want to show us theirs, then I'm happy to see. Uh, okay, let us say hello to a uh, friend over here, and let us invite on Jonathan Hopkins from Smith Street Stage. He tried to uh, send us an invite uh, to join a few moments ago. Let us uh, honor that request. Meanwhile, I'll throw up an image of Smith Street Stage. This is Jonathan Hopkins at Smith Street Stage. Again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had a lost episode of New York Shakespeare Live where we tried to speak with Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Did you say that I was on the only lost episode of this yes, program? Sir. Yes, sir. Wow. Just, about, just about a year ago, maybe less than that, you were on the program and we were speaking at that time uh, about, I think you guys were working on something called a Hamlet Rehearsed. And yeah, we, were, we did a, yeah, we did a, ha uh, a sort of a, a Hamlet documentary and kind of a COVID documentary. We got, once, you know, people were able to get their shots. We got together in a theater and had these sort of small pods of actors rehearse um, rehearse material from Hamlet, um, which we were really, really uh, proud of and really excited about. We're working on editing that and getting that out soon. So, so that episode. Well, I guess I have to say that because it's it's no longer available out there because that's the lost video. So I'm going to have to do that plug, I guess, that, before we get into the company there. there. I want you to plug it all over again, Jonathan, because uh, we, we, we somehow that episode, we had, you know, a technical glitch at the end of the program and it didn't allow me to save it to the Instagram video section. So it's, it's lost into the ether. Uh, and Mark, Mark Zuckerberg is sitting there somewhere. <laughs> <I can't laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the, the, you know, we'll, I'll come on when it's, when we've edited it and we release it, I'll come on and plug it again. And that'd probably okay. be even better. I would think. I so, think so. I, I'm, I'm game for that. Okay. So, so Jonathan, uh, you are, uh, you and your wife, Beth Ann, are the, the heads of Smith Street Stage over in Brooklyn, in the Carroll Park area of Brooklyn. And you guys have been uh, at it for, I think it was like about 11, 12 years now. Is that right? Well, yeah, I guess it just depends on how you count the last few. We did, we did 10 years in a row from 2010 to 2019. And then it's, it was, it was two years off for us, of course. And so this is our first year. So this is our our 11th year in our in a way and our in our 13th year in a way i suppose right or 13 right. years since we first started mm -hmm. so. right okay so you guys have been there for a while and you've developed a following at the at carroll park uh, over there and uh you, you you've done some really really fun stuff uh every year you have your your shakespeare outdoor presentation that you do over there again you, you had a, a layoff of a couple of years due to covid but now you guys are back out and you have a production of the comedy of errors coming up i think it's this week it starts right week yeah first preview um wednesday two days from now mm -hmm. okay so tell me you guys i know that for you guys it was a, a very challenging couple of years where you really uh dug deep and reevaluated how you're going to move forward uh given everything that's going on with the coronavirus and you wanted to be really really cautious about exposing yourselves, exposing your actors, and that kind of went into what, how Hamlet rehearsed even came about, is that you guys were, made sure everyone was, was uh, had their shots, had, you know, had all the, all the protections in place. So now, at wh what point did you feel like, you know what, I think that this has abated enough that we are ready to kind of come out of that, that area and get back out and do another production? I think we just took the temperature of the of the industry and and the union and uh just observed that people were returning to theater and people seemed more um willing to assume the risks that any kind of um interaction like entails um in in the era of covid um and that we felt like we could do something that would keep our artists safe and still allow us a process that would you know, deliver um, a piece of artistic quality 
And I think we've, we've, we've done that. I think um, we have a great show that's uh, ready for this week and ready for an audience um, and ready to bring people together and reunite us with a community that has meant a lot to us since we started doing shows out there. Um, and I, I, I think we've done our best to keep um, artists safe and be uh, communicative and to provide our folks the, um, the, the resources to feel that they were being taken care of um, and they weren't gonna be um, exploited or unappreciated or anything like that. So I think it was like it's sort of a combination of factors that, uh, you know, but, th but I think that was the way we were thinking of it. Um, we thought that people, uh, that people need to see this work, um, that people need to be together, that our um, artists need to work on plays and, and audiences need to see them. Um, and that when we would have the opportunity to be a part of that return and a part of um, the joy of that reunion and also I, the, the healing that I hope live arts and being together can bring people that we, um, we wanted to be out there doing it. Um, okay. So I feel good. I feel good about the pace that we set um, in coming back. Um, I think we were cautious and ambitious um, and that we were just very, very clear about not putting anyone in danger. Okay. All right. Yeah. And, you know, even some of the major productions that are going on around town, Macbeth, uh, I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah, Macbeth on Broadway, uh, I know that they had a couple of periods of time where they had to uh, either shut down for several days or I think there was one production where one of the actors was out and Sam Gold, the director, had to jump in. You know, so it's not like COVID is gone. It's it's yeah. certainly the numbers are down, and but it's still out there and it's still, it's still a factor. So, you know, I, I remember in uh, one of our discussions last year uh, with uh, some of the outdoor theater groups, we, we were talking about how as we were getting back out and people were even in the, in the open air park setting, there was still, you know, some different ways of approaching it than what we traditionally did in the past. Whereas, you know, kind of like New York Classical, they require reservations now. You can't just show up. Or, you know, they, they uh, require that the actors uh, have, you know, have their vaccinations and that the audience, you know, either presents a vaccination card. You know, do you have any of those criteria in place? Or yeah. is it not as structured as that? Yeah, we do. We, we have our personnel vaccinated and we have um, a testing regimen. So they make sure that people who are coming into the rehearsals um, have tested negative and tested negative recently. Um, mm -hmm. We have a protocol for when people have to miss rehearsal because of a positive test. Um, so, yeah, we, we developed that um, with Jordan Gamalek, who's our COVID safety officer, who's been fantastic. Um, and sort of been clear in communicating that to all of our artists. Um, Natalie uh, Carvalho is our ombuds person. So there's also an independent reporting structure that if any of our artists feel that something is happening, um, that they just want to, that either they want to report or they just want to uh, have a chat about or they just need some element of support. We've, we've built in that independent reporting structure so that we also feel that folks, um, aren't going to be in a position in which they have to weigh um, their status as a working artist, like inside the power structures that are sort of inherent to a rehearsal room, even a pretty egalitarian rehearsal room, like we mm -hmm. tried to uh, run at the company. Um, so yeah, we've got uh, the, the protocols in place and we've been able to follow them um, and feel um, good about that. Um, it just would have been, you know, s such a, like a, a heinous, terrible thing to have our first show back from this um, just like harrowing and challenging time be something where we were like exploiting our artists or like exerting pressure on them to do something that they didn't feel was safe. So we, we didn't really have any interest in that being our return to, um, to this work. So I think we also had a, a little bit of clarity on that point that you know, um, our board of directors understood and um, I, I think our artists understood. So, uh, so it can be done. Um, it can be done. Okay. All right. So now you're, you're back with the comedy of errors and, you know, it's, it's outdoors, it's summer, everyone loves Shakespeare comedies. Now, what, what, why the decision to go with uh, the comedy of errors as opposed to one of the, the more common ones in the summer night stream as you like it, 12th night. What about the comedy of errors jump out to you guys this year? 
a few things. We had a few goals um, for the show. Um, we thought that uh, laughter could be a part of the healing. Um, and so we wanted to pick something that was funny. I would give people a chance to get together and to laugh. Um, we thought that, uh, at least we, our, our artists felt keenly a desire for reunion with the community that has supported us um, and provided so many great audiences. Uh, and so we wanted to choose a show in which there was some element of, of, of searching or reunion or trying to get back together. Um, and Comedy of Errors, because the joke of these twins is premised um, like theatrically on the idea that they can't come together at any given point there's also like a, a, a like a tacit tension of separation because you as an audience member know that that you know that that actor has to stay apart from that actor or the constructs of the show's joke would tumble like a house of cards and so i feel like there's also this um sort of almost like unconscious sense of people being apart um, that I, I feel like is something that we, of course, have all lived with over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And so since that's like an animating force of the show, we thought that it could act on, um, you know, the, the emotional life and imaginations of our audience. Um, and also we wanted to do something that felt theatrical. We wanted to do something that was in um, the, the tradition of plays and doing theater. And um, Dan Hassey, who was also the director, the film director for Hamlet Rehearsed, had this like really great pitch of comedy, a comedy of errors that would be in the style of, um, you know, Laurel and Hardy and, and vaudeville and Looney Tunes and these sort of like, like very silly, rich comic traditions. Mm -hmm. And that would, so therefore it's going to, it's going to feel like a play. And so the people who are at it are going to very much feel like they're at, um, a work of theater and experiencing theatrical convention, um, which feels good because we've, we've, there's been no loss of chances, you know, to, to um, watch television and, and, you know, and, and movies and read books over the last few years. But this, but this particular thing that we do, that theater artists do, um, has been uh, absent for most of us. So uh, we thought it'd be funny and it is, we thought it'd feature a reunion. We thought that it would sort of work. Oh, and there's also just like this sort of like frantic, chaotic energy um, that just, I kind of feel like, feels like our lives now. Um, right. Like this sense of just like this chaos and just people who are like, just like barely holding it together um, mm -hmm. and sort of having some of like the worst days of their lives on stage. But it's funny. You know, and so it's, you know, <laughs> um, and so I, laughing at that, the misfortune yeah, of the people. Laughing. Right, right. And so yeah. it's this, it's sort of like wonderful thing of, um, you know, holding the mirror up to nature, but like not too close up to nature, um, right. you know, and, and letting us laugh at this, um, um, you know, l l letting us laugh a, a little bit. So I checked all of those boxes um, and, uh, we felt good about the the play, and we felt good about Dan directing it, um, and and feel like we're, we've um, feel very lucky to be where we are two days out of um, having an audience out there sharing it with us. Okay, well, well, I can't wait to check it out. I'm going to try to come down to uh, Brooklyn and check out that that uh, production. So, uh, uh, Jonathan, if people want to find out more about your company, about the Street Stage, about your production of the Comedy of Errors, where can they go to find out about the information? Uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Facebook Smith Street Stage, Instagram Smith Street Stage, and our website, uh, smithstreetstage.org. Okay. All right. Well, listen, congratulations on getting back out there. Uh, it sounds like you guys put a lot of thought and a lot of work into this thing. And I hope the audience uh, comes out and, and in droves and, and almost overwhelmingly so, that's so that you guys have as big an audience as possible for this this reunion uh, with yourselves and, and the the, the audience that you've cultivated uh, over there in Cal Park. Uh, congratulations, Jonathan. Regards to your wife, and uh, I hope to see you guys out there. Most definitely. Thank you, and thanks for the work you do. Thank you very much. All right, so that is Jonathan Hopkins from Smith Street Stage. All right, and uh, we have a, a, a fan. I, I don't know what the, the name is over there, but 
We have a, a Smith Street Stage fan who's sending their love out there. So, so a lot of love for Smith Street Stage, Jonathan and Bethann over in Brooklyn. Uh, and I urge you to check out The Comedy of Errors. So uh, from the top of the program, we've been trying to connect with uh, our uh, first guest, and that was uh, Romeo and Bernadette. And unfortunately, it looks like we uh, have not been able to... Oh, Mark is back. Uh, let's see if I can connect with Mark now. Oh, Mark is unable to join. You know what? Uh, for whatever reason, Mar uh, Mark and the Romeo and Bernadette team, I truly, truly apologize. Uh, as much as I've been trying to to make the connection with you guys and, and bring you guys, it just for whatever reason, I don't know if it's Mark's device or whatever the case is, the internet gods are just not smiling on this uh, tonight. I, I, whenever I try, I hit the, the button to connect with Mark and to ask him to join us live on the program, it keeps on telling me that Mark is unable to join. So, uh, guys, if uh, from the Romeo and Bernadette social media team who's, who's on this chat, if yourselves, if one of you guys, even just for a couple of minutes, uh, feel like you want to come on and uh, give us some information about the show. And, and of course, uh, behind the scenes, we'll, we'll uh, reschedule with Mark and with Justin uh, for a different uh, medium in which we can and have a conversation with those guys and, and uh, give more discussion about their, uh, their wonderful show. Uh, but if, if one of the social media members wants to come on at any point, just drop me a note in the comment section at the bottom and let me know. And I'll be happy to throw it over to you guys and, and we'll have a chat. Because unfortunately, as, as much as I'm trying, it seems like I'm just not able to uh, connect with uh, Mark uh, in this format. So uh, I'll keep on trying. But uh, if, if I can't, then uh, I'll ask maybe the social media team members. Uh, I believe that Matthew, I think that's you out there. If you want to come on for a couple of minutes and let us know a little bit about Romeo and Bernadette for tonight, and then we'll come back to you guys another time. Uh, okay, so uh, and I'll try it even one more time just just to try. Uh, no, Mark is unable to join. Okay, so uh, again, Matthew, over the social media team, if you guys want to come on for a minute, just drop a, li a line in the comment section, let me know. Otherwise, we will go on to our next guest of the evening. And that is going to, oh, oh, Mark. Uh, Mark is here in the bottom. He says, I can only text. I cannot connect. Uh, hi, it's okay. I'm just not getting an invite. Uh, yeah, Mark, I'm seeing your comments at the bottom of the, the page in the in the text box at the bottom of the page. Uh, but for whatever reason, every time I hit the button, you know, either from you know this direction or that direction, the, whatever uh, um, operation lets me send you the invite to join, it keeps on telling me that you're unable to join. So unfortunately, just just it's not in the cards for us to be able to connect tonight. And I'm so sorry to whoever is here from that audience to catch the discussion with Romeo and Bernadette. I was uh, eagerly looking forward to that discussion. Uh, but perhaps we can reschedule with Mark and Justin for uh, a Zoom discussion, and we'll, we'll see if we can uh, get that worked out. But Mark, you can, by all means, if you're, if you're here, please send me comments in the bottom. Or again, Matthew from the uh, social media team, if you want to jump on for a few minutes and uh, plug Romeo and Bernadette, by all means, do so. And again, we'll reschedule something else uh, for another night. Uh, meanwhile, let us go to our next group of the evening, and that is Hamlet Isn't Dead. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in the evening, Hamlet Isn't Dead, it's, it's one of the groups that I really love around town. And they are uh, renowned for their, their very uh, self-deprecating sense of humor. And their tagline is, it's always shifting what number uh, of the best Shakespeare group in town they are whether it's the 649th or the 323rd or whatever the case might be. And they're, they're progressively moving forward. I think they're down to the double digits at this point. So <laughs> maybe they'll break the top 10 at some point soon. But nonetheless, uh, we will invite three members of the team from Hamlet is Dead to join us. And let us start with the director. And that is uh, Valerie Peter Chong. Uh, so we'll ask Valerie to join us. And we also have two other members of the team. We have, uh, we have, is that, oh, okay. I think you might want to turn your camera around, Valerie. Yeah, there we go. Hey, Valerie, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, I don't know why my headphones aren't working, but. Well, it's, it's just one of those nights where, where certain technical <laughs> things are just, just not working out, no matter how hard we're trying. You can blame uh, our show. It's cursed. <laughs> it's just one of those things. And, okay, Sam is asking us to join. All right, so I think, hey, Sam, uh, that is uh, Maureen. Hello, Maureen. Hi, Rodney. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having us on tonight. Oh, the trifecta. We have uh, Samantha Thema, and she is our Lady Macbeth. Yes. Yes. Hi. All right. Hello. How are you, Sam? 
I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Doing great. Do you prefer Sam or Samantha? Oh, either works. Yeah, Sam is short. Right. We'll go with that. Okay. All right. So, Sam. So, uh, we have Valerie, we have Maureen, and we have Sam from the Hamlet Isn't Dead production of Macbeth. And that started, I believe it was this past Saturday night, right? That's uh, correct. You had your first uh, performance this past Saturday night, and you guys are running, I believe, until the 18th. Is that right? Or somewhere, somewhere in the next, the next No, week. we are running until the 11th. Oh, the 11th. So, oh, okay. So it's shorter. We than only that. have a few more shows left. So get them while they're hot. <laughs> okay. All right. And, and, and I'm hoping to catch uh, one of those. Uh, uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to hide my face so you don't uh, see me out there uh, staring and saying hmm. hmm. But nonetheless, uh, we're, we're, we I've had a lot of chats in the past with uh, David Andrew Laws, uh, with uh, oh James Reitmeyer Jr. and uh, with uh, Megan Greener from from Hamlet Isn't Dead. So we we love you guys. You guys do great work. Uh, tell us about Macbeth. Uh, how did it come about? How did you guys get involved? How what's what's it like? What was the first performance like? Give us the lowdown. Okay. Wow. That's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess I'll start. So um, I got involved. So I'm the associate artistic director of Hamlet Isn't Dead. Um, and I joined on pretty recently. It's been about a year and a half now. I joined on, uh, or actually almost two years. I joined on during the pandemic, uh, the summer of 2020. Um, this is my first time directing. I assistant directed a couple performances and I got a call one day. I knew that I was going to be doing Macbeth at some point. I thought it would be uh, this coming fall. And then I got a call from David who was like, can you do it sooner? And I went, okay. And <laughs> I was very, uh, quite nervous at the time. Um, still a little nervous if I'm being honest. This <laughs> all feels very surreal. Um, well, but well, I couldn't have a better just, career. You know, just, just to not to add to your nervousness, but you only have, you know, a few blocks away, you have uh, Daniel Craig and Ruth Mega doing Macbeth. So it's just, just yeah. a tiny, tiny bit of pressure. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what is it like? And then the Denzel Washington movie. And so Denzel Washington <laughs> and Francis McDormand doing the film version of you know, just uh, nothing major. So, so what's it like doing this Macbeth under the shadow of these two huge, major, earth-shaking performances that are going on or that have been kind of dominating the New York scene for the past six months? Yeah, I mean, that was probably the biggest motivator of my anxiety, I would say, is <laughs> that um, we had these two big, uh, big performances coming this year, and also everyone knows Macbeth. Like, if you know... If you've studied Shakespeare at all, or even if you just took classes, English classes in high school, you probably have read Macbeth. Yeah. And so um, my task was, how do I do something different with this? Um, and my my approach uh, in all of my work that I do, both with theater and beyond, is to really involve a communal community approach um, to how I how I operate. And so I wanted to tell the story not just of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, but of the community that they're a part of, of this, this country of Scotland in this time and how they were impacted by the selfish decisions of just a couple of people. Um, and because of that, we, we all worked together. It was a very exploratory, creative process. There was a lot of devising work that went into it. Um, I'm sure Mo will, will talk a little bit more about, uh, about the music, but we went with this um, folk punk, Celtic punk style. And the folk approach is, is very communal. It's very much just jump in. And if you sing off key, as long as you are confident, then do your thing. Um, so yeah, we really built a community together, which okay. I think is the thing I'm I'm proudest of is just how much of a family we've become. Okay, so Maureen, why don't we jump to you? Uh, you you are the music director for this production, and you know Macbeth. You know there's so much stuff that you can you, you can have fun with with you know the the ominous things that are happening and the uh, the okay. sound of the the horse bring that you know there's so much that can happen with that with the oral environment that's that's happening. So how did you approach this uh, setting up the music for this production? Great question. So uh, I had the privilege of getting on the project a bit earlier. So Val and I 
had the chance to chat about two months before the rehearsal process truly started. And initially it's, it's the usual spitballing ideas, see what lands, but Val's true intention was to show the stripping away of community, show how, uh, like they mentioned, the actions of the few influence the community as a whole. So um, immediately one of the things that I wanted to do to reflect that is strip away the music as we get closer to the end of the show. And um, for, for all the Shakespeare buffs out there, you know that you can't go through any Shakespearean work without having some music in it. There are a few exceptions to that rule, of course, um, namely some of the uh, some of the big dramas like Hamlet, Othello. But in the majority of the shows that he's ever written, it's there's going to be that one big musical number that's in there. So um, immediately, what we started with was taking that folk punk feel. I did some studying up. I was familiar with folk punk, but I did a, a true dive into it at that point and just uh, the freedom of it. Uh, I've had experiences with Ren Fairs before. I used to perform at Renaissance Fairs. Um, I'm big on improv. And the beauty with uh, folk is that it's never set in stone. It is a process that continues to change throughout the decades, throughout the centuries. And what's kind of lovely about um, folk songs in this in particular is that some of these are over 500 years old, some of the songs that we're using. And they age so well. And they mm. update to an electric style so well. Um, and the way that the show starts, so come 15 minutes early and you'll get a chance at seeing the pre-show. We've got some great songs in store for you. And we've got this just high beat electric drum kit. We've got um, electric guitar and we've got a fantastic piano as well. And all of it together just sets the tone for what's going to be this harsh play this harsh story that's going to be told. And mm -hmm. uh, as you go through, I mean, no spoilers, but also spoilers. As you go through, <laughs> you'll get to see how bits and pieces of it start to get stripped away. We've got, the, we've got the electric guitar on overdrive for the first half of the show. And then all of a sudden you notice it becomes just an acoustic guitar. And then okay. from there, you realize there's only one instrument left. It's just a drum right before act five, scene five, where they're marching off to the final battle. And then okay. for the ultimate plateau of the show, it's the consequences have been seen. Um, it, there is a new king for Scotland. There's no music at all. We are, we're together a cappella, and we're existing Very in the space. And there's a bit of a beauty to that, especially in the space that we're in. Uh, for those who know the center at West Park, um, it is a church. It was originally built as a church, and it's now a multi-use space for artists everywhere. And it's fantastic to utilize the acoustics in there, especially for any kind of a cappella work, because it just makes it all the more haunting. And uh, you, you gotta you gotta have that in Macbeth. And it's it's a visually it's a beautiful space, but yeah, absolutely, it's it's okay. a wonderful place for you guys to set this production. It's it's, it's even the fact that uh, it's uh, there's that that backdrop of the religious environment, and there is this this uh, this this struggle between morality and immorality uh, and everything else that's happening. It's it's a very very nice choice. Uh, so uh, let's go to Sam. Sam, you are our Lady Macbeth here. Uh, so tell me, is this your first time with Hamlet Isn't Dead? No, I actually joined, um, when did I join? I joined recently. I did Measure for Measure with them. Um, okay. And Val, assistant, directed that one as well. So we had worked together a bit, which was really nice. Okay, so so uh, you and Val, I'm sure, worked very closely as to how to bring Lady Macbeth uh, to life for this production. So what what is uh, your take on the Lady Macbeth? You know, some people see her as the, or maybe I'm, I'm asking you to spill the beans, but give us a little preview. Uh, some people uh, see Lady Macbeth as the, the aggressor that, that turns Macbeth from the, uh, the clear-minded, virtuous uh, follower of the king into uh, something more sinister. And some people see her in a different way. What, what has been your uh, insight into Lady M? I think that... Um... It was a few things we ended up building it off of, but we the first conversation Val and I had was sort of about the backstory about how she really is coming from, you know, Macbeth just got to fight this war and 
they just had this kid die and it was the first, you know, and she meanwhile has been at home and, and having to deal with this on her own. Right. And Macbeth's gotten to purge all of that and do all of that. And meanwhile, um, she's kind of been stuck with that and sort of coming from a place of like, this person hasn't dealt with that in a, you know, hasn't been able to process that. And then um, in terms of, you know, Val's vision of the community sort of falling apart. I think what Daniel, the uh, the actor playing Macbeth and I really found and had a lot of fun with was, um, I think usually you see that relationship between them at a certain point fall apart. And I think what's interesting that we're noticing in the world today and like in terms of this play, what I feel like is something we've successfully done really well is like, that I think they actually cling on tighter to each other and get even closer and um as the as they are the ones that you know rift like, cause a rift between this community they are the only things they have clinging on to each other and then it just becomes you know obviously if you know the show it becomes quite a mess and it doesn't yeah. go well but i think that's been really fun to play and i've I've gotten to discover things that I, I feel like I haven't seen in a version of Macbeth with that relationship before, where it really is. Um, and it's more fun to play her that way as like, a, you know, clinging and what are what are you going to do when you know you're deep down responsible for that? And and I also think we, you know, Val and I talked a lot about as the relationship progresses, taking on that emotional weight as uh, Macbeth makes more and more of the choices. And, and Lady M from the beginning had one choice in mind and she wasn't going to cross that line again, um, truly, I think. And then, and then had to make the decision in the play, do I uh, stick to that line or do I cross it for my, you know, husband? And I think that's, I really like that scene every night because it's a decision I feel you have to make every night. And it's like, I don't know what I'm going to pick tonight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Isn't that such a great insight? Is that, you know, once once you've you've made that decision, you've crossed that threshold, there's really no going back. And yeah. you can either cling to your loved one and, you know, try to, to love and, you know, fight your way through it. Or you're just, you're just ceding to, you know, all, to your demise really so so that's really it really is that life and death decision that you guys are making yeah and something that val pointed out when we were working on the sleepwalking scene which i think is like such a such a complicated scene right mm -hmm. um but val pointed out that Macbeth had been gone in the field for a few days and that's why she's sleepwalking and that's it's such a simple thing to point out but i think so many times we make that scene so complicated and really what if you know that's where she's coming from is that Macbeth is gone and it is that fear that's driving her and you know the thing that she has chosen to cling on to because she had to make that choice mm -hmm. uh is gone and and she knows he's kind of gone loose and doesn't know if he's coming back and i that fear draw, driving in that scene along with the emotional weight we kind of developed through the show has been so I, I i can't describe it it's been like such a freeing experience i i i love working with val by the way so i'll only have great things to say but um it really was great to develop her in that way because I think neither of us had seen it like that. And it, and we really, I think we discovered something fun and special. Well, everything you guys are saying just sounds fantastic. And you're getting a lot of love from the audience. So you're getting a lot of, a lot of great feedback. Uh, Pam, Pam Bransma, I don't know what that is. Says okay, awesome. My aunt. So, <laughs> my aunt. Okay, so <laughs> uh, some family love. But nonetheless, you're getting a lot yes. of great uh, feedback from the audience. And, and I personally can't wait to check out uh, your production. Uh, Hamlet Isn't Dead always does uh, tip-top work. Uh, so I can't wait to check that out. And I urge the audience out there to check out Hamlet Isn't Dead. Folks, where can they go to find out the dates and ticket information? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat after this. Um, but if you go to hamletisndead.com, you can find our Eventbrite links for all of our shows there. So we're coming back Thursday, Friday, and then a matinee and an evening performance on Saturday. Okay. And maybe, maybe with this version of Macbeth, you guys are going to move up to the top 10 of Shakespeare groups uh, in New York. <laughs> It's whatever yeah. most. Oh, I don't know. That's a big jump. <laughs> <laughs> the beauty All right, ladies, it is listen. 
the beauty with it is we do the house speech every night. We just keep changing the number on them. They, they never know what to <laughs> whatever we feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all, all three of you. You guys are wonderful. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Good luck with the production. I hope you want to catch it. Uh, and I urge the audience to check out HamletIsNDead.com. Get your tickets for this before it disappears. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. Everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was uh, Maureen Fenninger. That was Valerie Peter Chong, and that was Sam right. of, of Hamlet Isn't Dead. And we, uh, again, definitely check out their production of Macbeth, and that is uh, this week uh, through the weekend. So uh, catch it while it lasts. And let us go, uh, let us check our, our roster of who we still have. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, uh, I really wish we could have, no, Mark has been able to join. I, I've been trying all night to get uh, to connect with Mark. Saltzman, the writer of Romeo and Bernadette, but it just doesn't look like it's in the cards tonight. So I'll, I'll reach out to them uh, after this program concludes uh, to set up another discussion. But we do want to feature Romeo and Bernadette. Uh, it, it's, it's the New York Times critics pick, and, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, and I, I wanted to bring that information to the New York City audience. So we are at the end of our time, and we have one last group to bring you guys tonight. And that is our friends, uh, Danny Higgins and Nicole Saban. Let me find their image. Uh, of the East Line Theater that's based in Long Island. Let us ask them to join us before uh, the in Instagram gods decide that we've gone on too long, decide to kick us off. Uh, so East Line Theater, let's see, that's you guys. I think they're going to be together. Uh, let's see if we can successfully ask them to join us. Oh, Penny and Nicole. Hello. Hello. How are you guys? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I've, well, I've got my mystery uh, beverage in this uh, very, very delightful cup over here. And I, I think I might be three sheets to the wind by the time uh, <laughs> this program concludes. So oh, I, I'll, take, I'll take a nice bit sip. <laughs> it's just when it devolves into talk radio, right? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So, so you guys are, uh, I think, we, we, Nicole, we spoke to you, I believe it was last year around this time. Mm -hmm. And I think what it was was Danny. We were supposed to speak to you, but then you were you had to go on stage or something. An actor got sick. You had to jump on stage or something like that. Yeah. So uh, this time we have both of you, and you guys are uh, two of the the uh, the top heads uh, behind uh, East Line Theater. And just just remind us for or those who didn't hear you last time around, East Line Theater is a relatively young group in Long Island, and you guys are presenting challenging works and the classics and you're touring all over the place. How, how did East Line start? Uh, well, East Line's actually not that young. Um, East Line is actually celebrating its 10-year anniversary next year. Um, but we didn't become a nonprofit until 2017. So um, that we're kind of new in that way. Uh, Nicole and I have been leading the organization for the last two, three years, something like that. Yeah, how long have I known you? Uh, <laughs> it feels like forever. Um, but... Um, but the, the organization is, is going all the way back to its founding kind of prioritized, um, you know, the, the, the rarer done works, which eventually found its way into the classics, which eventually found its way into the Shakespeare's. So uh, it kind of was like the natural inertia for us. Pre-pandemic, okay. we were in Atlanta, and now we are sort of based out of Babylon. We have offices in Babylon, but we tour all over the place. We're currently in we at Westbury Arts for the production of Being Earnest, which is a new queer take on the importance of being earnest for Pride Month. Woo! Okay. All right. Fantastic. And and you guys, I mean, you guys are just as active as can be. You've got being earnest going on right now. Last month you were doing something totally different. What were you doing last month? Uh, Cyrano. <laughs> Cyrano. Just, so, yeah, it's really from like <laughs> from, from, from three major classics in a, in a row. <laughs> you know, uh, you, but but I I really I tip my hat to you guys because you guys are doing. I think I, talk, I spoke to Nicole about this last time. You know, the, the Long Island audience, I'm very familiar with the Long Island audience because I, I did a, lot, a ton of stuff out there back in the day. And they are very musical theater oriented. And they want their traditional, you know, five, six shows or whatever it is that they've seen a hundred times, but they, they just love those shows and they want to see them again. So the fact that you guys are presenting new and challenging works or even something like Importance of Being Earnest and you're presenting a new and different take on it, that takes a lot of guts, uh, <laughs> a lot of stamina to, to put that work together and to get it out there in front of the audiences. So, so what, what's the decision-making process that goes into taking things like this and putting it out there? Uh, life's too short to do the same old thing the same old way. 
<laughs> but why? I mean, you know, I'm going to say a name that's going to make you smile, but Joe Papp thought the same thing. He thought, why should we do Shakespeare in this sort of esoteric removed way that people can't relate to, that doesn't reflect the community in which it's being presented for, or in an, aff an affordable way for people to be able to see it. And he signed takes the same to heart. So we think if we're going to do the importance of being earnest, we're going to make sure that it speaks to the community that we serve, which be pretty gay. <laughs> 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 we're very <laughs> queer <laughs> and all kinds okay. um but um so no it just it just comes from a place of what how does it speak to us and as artists letting that reflect its way through the work okay all right well that's fantastic so you guys are in so many different places uh i think your your roster for uh or, or your your uh list of all the different places you're going to be for uh two gentlemen of rona which is what you have coming up next after being earnest I think you're in what, maybe like 12 different parks or something like yeah. that? 12 locations across Long Island. Uh, we okay. open from this Saturday at Clark Botanic Gardens in Albertson. And we've got a bunch of different places. I'm not going to list off 12 locations right now, but you can go to eastlandtheater.org for them all. The, ones the cool, with, one. The cool the one is on, the, on, on July 23rd. We're performing at the Fire Island Lighthouse, which is so beautiful. We're going to be performing Shakespeare like in the sand dunes on Fire Island. It's going to be so pretty. So, okay. so if there's like... To bring a picnic. <laughs> well, our, our other big one is on July 17th. We're doing the Huntington Arts Summer Festival, which is at the Chapin Rainbow Stage. Uh, I recommend that one for uh, friends who like amplified sound because they have microphones there. So. <laughs> they and nice lighting. Nice lighting. If you I like call, a nighttime performance. That's I something. call it Eastland at the Hollywood Bowl. You know, <laughs> it feels you know, So one of the things that we've experienced or we've, we've heard from the many different uh, outdoor Shakespeare groups that we speak with is that coming out of the coronavirus era, it's a much different process of getting your park permits and getting everything in place to run all the different parks. Uh, so is, has that been, you're doing 12 parks uh, over the course of several weeks. Is it, uh, you spent as much time rehearsing a show as getting all your park permits and all your permissions in place? Uh, yeah, so basically the way that this sort of, <clears throat> the way that this sort of works is that a lot of places out on Long Island are run either through county or local legislatures. So most of these parks are already being handled by local governments. So it's more like kind of you're skipping the whole getting a permit thing and going straight to the people who already manage the park and are focusing on bringing programming to their community. So okay. a lot of, kind of a couple of steps that we get to skip over. So we are very blessed well, in that so way. So we had, when we did Romeo and Juliet last summer, we had eight locations. We've expanded to 12 this year. Um, so we had some relationships already in place. And then we'd formed some relationships with some libraries that have outdoor venues over the last year. So we've moved into those. And our relationship gr grew with like the Babylon Citizens mm -hmm. Council on the Arts. Um, so the Huntington Arts Council. I, I, I do have to say we spend a, probably uh, two thirds of our time yeah. calling parks and one third of our time rehearsing. Um, but yeah, we spent, but... spent a lot of time on the phone with various levels of bureaucrats trying to find the person mm -hmm. who I'm like, you know, the person who does concerts, can I speak to them? <laughs> you know. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of that, but it. Of like the 30 places we called, we got 12. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, it's there's a lot, of, a lot of chasing places that don't pan out or are not working for this year, but right. most of the time it, you know, once you, once you find the people that are really passionate about it as we are, mm -hmm. like when they hear you, you know, you can tell when you've gotten the right person because they're like, they kind of like gasp a little and they're like, oh my God, you know, they get excited that finally someone like this is mm -hmm. coming to them. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we're very fortunate that the people we're collaborating with this year are those people. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a similar question to what I posed to Jonathan Hopkins at Mystery Stage. So you're doing Two Gentlemen of Verona, which again, mm -hmm. it's not you know as as well known as a Midsummer Night's Dream or As You Like It or Twelve Night. You know the, the three or four major ones that everyone knows. So what, what was the process of deciding on Two Gents? Well, it's kind of funny. So we started last year with Romeo and Juliet, which mm -hmm. is kind of you don't really need to explain your decision making behind picking Romeo and Juliet. So. Yeah. But we decided that we thought it would be fun and we had a, a, a director who was an, an, an adapter who was really passionate about Two Gents. And we thought it'd be fun mm -hmm. to market it as East Line Returns to Verona um, and to go with a, you know, um, a more traditional comedy an earlier comedy on Shakespeare's part. Something that would be a little bit more challenging and is more kind of the work we would choose. Like East Line wouldn't necessarily always do a Romeo and Juliet. Like that's not something that we would outright really prioritize on, a, on, a, on an often basis. But Two Gentlemen kind of is because it has that challenge to it. It, um, you know, it has its flaws to some extent that need to be fixed. 
It right. also has a dog. Yeah, we and were excited love about the dogs. Dog. <laughs> um, we were excited about the much more even split in the main characters. There's not like mm -hmm. two characters, and that's it. The the four main characters mm -hmm. sort of evenly split the plot of the show. Mm -hmm. Right, it's um, an ensemble piece. More ensemble based. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It allowed us also to condense the cast a little bit from this year, from last year. Like last year, we had a lot of people in the show, which we realized that's a lot to handle in, for co a, in COVID. In, in the COVID, COVID and like it's just it. <laughs> right a lot to handle we realized we should prioritize shows that we can condense more for just ease of scheduling and two gents was just one of those choices so okay all right well listen i i can't wait to check it out I, i'm hoping to catch you guys uh i believe it's this saturday uh so we'll see if i can make that uh make that work out. Do, do not, not go to do not go to clock botanic <laughs> it's you could go this yes, saturday but too. we won't be there <laughs> you guys are you, you're breaking my heart <laughs> 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 okay all right, listen, uh, I, I urge you guys to check out uh, East Line Theater. You guys are, are a brave soul. You're bringing classical and challenging pieces to uh, audiences all across Long Island. And I think you guys are just great. Uh, and I can't wait to see you in person. Uh, where can people go to find out more about your show? They can go to East Line Theater, R-E at the end, the English way, dot org. Um, and we have another weekend of being earnest this weekend. And then the following weekend, we open the Two Gentlemen Verona in Albertson. And you can find all 12 dates listed on our website. Okay. All right. Fantastic. And Nicole, uh, Danny, thank you guys for coming us. Thanks for hanging in to the very end. You are, at, as you know, once upon a time when I was doing stand-up comedy and I was the, the final act of about 27 acts, uh, the guy that, that was about to put me on stage said, you're the headliner. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have no problem being a finale. We are the headliners. On <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to compete with any folks. <laughs> okay, but listen, you guys are great. Keep up all the great stuff you're doing. Keep plugging away. And, and uh, I, I hope all good things come to you. Uh, all the best to East Line Theater, Danny and Nicole. Thank you, guys. Check out East Line Theater. That's R-E-T-N.com. Thank you, guys. Okay, so that was Danny Higgins and uh, Nicole Saban of the East Line Theater based in Long Island, bringing uh, two gentlemen of Verona to audiences all around Long Island. Uh, and that is coming up as of, I believe, the 12th, June 12th. So we've had a ton of great guests for you tonight. And I'm, I'm going to look just, just one last time. I'm going to look and see if I can connect with Mark Saltzman. Uh, no, I, I, just, I wish I could uh, let me try it this way. No, uh, I'm I'm sorry. I I really really wish I could have made that happen. Uh, let me try it from another way, just just for the heck of it. Mark, I've just sent you an invite. It lets me get that far. If for some reason you're still with us and you're still able to join, by all means, I'd love to chat with you. And we've been kind of teasing it all evening. We've been hoping to connect. We've been having some connectivity issues. Uh, let's try this just one last last ditch effort to connect with Mark. If so, I'd love to chat with him. Otherwise, we'll reschedule with the folks from Romeo and Bernadette and uh, have another discussion with them uh, in another forum, perhaps a Zoom discussion, uh, maybe later this week or something like that. Uh, while we're waiting, waiting for this, you know, uh, the, the Hail Mary to see if Mark can join us, uh, let us recap whom we spoke with tonight. We spoke with Christopher Carter Sanderson and Henry Austin Chicago of the film version of Hamlet from Gula Rep. We spoke with uh, our friend uh, Jonathan Hopkins from Smith Street Stage. They have their production of the Comedy Errors coming up in the Carroll Park section of Brooklyn. And that starts uh, in about a week or so. Oh, no, this Wednesday, the, uh, the 8th. Oh, Mark is unable to join. Uh, it, just, it just wasn't in the cards tonight. I'm so sorry. Uh, we spoke with, um, uh, who was next? Uh, Sabrina Fabi of uh, New York Classical. They have their, their outdoor version of Cymbeline playing in three different parks around the city this summer. Uh, we had uh, Valerie Peter Chong. We had Maureen Fenger, Fenninger and uh, Sam Ipemi of the uh, Hamlet Isn't Dead, and they have their production at Bath that's already underway and it runs throughout the course of this week. We also spoke with Nicole Saban and Danny Higgins of the East Line Theater, and they have their version of The Two Gentlemen of Rona, and that runs on Long Island in 12 different spaces, uh, from June into July. So I urge you to check out the post-show notes that will that will include uh, with the recording of this thing, and you can connect with all those different groups, all the different individuals who are involved. And again, my sincerest apologies to Romeo and Bernadette. They were going to be our lead uh, guests tonight, 
but unfortunately, uh, it just it just wasn't in the cards throughout uh, our many attempts to connect. We just weren't able to make it happen. So again, I'll reach out to the social media team and to the uh, the gentleman, Mark Saltzman, and to Justin Ross Cohen. My apologies to you guys. Uh, I, I was really uh, looking forward to the discussion. Just just technically, we couldn't make it connect. Uh, so uh, I urge you to check out Romeo and Bernadette's website. Romeo and Bernadette, look them up on Google. Uh, they are a New York Times critics pick. They are a wonderful show. And again, I can't wait to have a connection with uh, Mark Saltzman and Justin Ross Cohen the writer and the director slash choreographer of that show to discuss uh, everything that's going on with uh, Romeo and Bernadette. So for all of you who joined us here tonight, I thank you so much for uh, giving us the last hour and a half or even more uh, of your time to learn everything about what's happening in the Shakespeare scene that's happening in New York. Uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, it seems like no one played uh, I'll Show You Mine If You Show Me Yours with us tonight. So we'll have to, we'll have to give them all a, a talking to you about that. But again, my name is Rodney Hakeem. Support your local Shakespeare. We have so many different uh, productions that are happening around town. Go support one of them, at least, if not more. Uh, you can find out everything that's happening in the world of Shakespeare in New York on our social media pages. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and everywhere else. You can catch all of our past videos. Again, we're NY Shakespeare. Uh, most social media right here on Instagram, where New York Shakespeare is spelled out. Again, thank you to all of our guests. My apologies again to Romeo and Bernadette, and we wish you all a good night.